Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar on GHB. We're going to get things started. My name is Dane Griffiths, and I'm the Associate Director of the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance and the facilitator of today's webinar. Please review the following items. We encourage you to share the recording of today's webinar with your local colleagues and community partners. We'll hear from our presenters for 45 minutes, and we'll wrap up with time at the end for Q&A. Please utilize the Zoom chat feature to ask questions at any point during the presentations. We will answer these questions at the end of the webinar in the order that they're received. This webinar is being hosted by the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance. We work with a network of stakeholders, including staff at community-based HIV service organizations, researchers, peers, and policymakers. And we seek to optimize the engagement of two-spirit, gay, bisexual, queer, and other cisgendered and transgendered men in Ontario's HIV prevention, treatment, and care cascade. We hope that you find today's webinar informative and relevant to your work with gay, bi, queer men. GHB is one substance used within social and sexual networks of gay men. The sexualized use of drugs, known as party and play, or sometimes chemsex, has been subject to increased interest in communities here in Ontario, across Canada, and globally. This webinar is timely as the GMSH continues to build and prepare to implement a set of interventions that promote the health of gay, bi, queer men who use drugs in Ontario. GHB itself has been on the receiving end of increased attention over the last number of years, from links to celebrity deaths on gay cruises, nightclub warnings, and gay venues banning GHB with zero tolerance approaches. On your screen, you'll see examples of efforts to communicate the dangers of GHB. Yet despite these warnings, we expect that gay and bi men will continue to use GHB, and they'll have varied knowledge and experience of both its intended and unintended effects, and those strategies that can reduce harms. The nature of substance use in our community is different than other populations and can stem from societal stigma, discrimination, and the stressors that come with being a sexual minority. Substance use, however, can be a way to reduce feelings of shame, contribute to the development of social networks, and enhance pleasure. This quote speaks well to some of the perceived benefits of GHB use over other party drugs, and it comes from a participant in a study by our first speaker. Dr. Joseph Palomar is an associate professor of population health at the NYU School of Medicine and a research affiliate at the NYU Center for Drug Use and HIV and Hepatitis C Research. He has over 18 years of drug research experience, two NIH-funded research grants, and has authored over 100 pap papers focusing on drug use epidemiology. His main research focus is new psychoactive substances and the use of party drugs like ecstasy and GHB. His club days are what led him to become a drug researcher many years ago, and he continues to study drug use among people who attend nightclubs and festivals today. And with that, I would like to hand it over to our first presenter, Dr. Joseph Palomar. Okay, so thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Great intro. Uh, I hope you're able to hear me. If not, please let me know. Um, so uh, I'm going to obviously discuss GHB today. I'm going to give you a brief overview of effects and things like that. And I'm also going to specifically discuss GHB use here in New York City. So first, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I was a frequent member of the New York City underground club scene for many years from about 1998 to 2005. And I still go out here and there, even though I'm much older now. But um, I had a lot of experience going to both gay and mixed and hetero clubs. So I think I, I personally got to see uh, a lot of different types of GHB use for many years throughout different scenes. Uh, I was actually supposed to be a police officer at the NYPD, 
uh, and I turned down the job in 2000 because I decided I wanted to prevent harm and do drug research rather than just arrest people who use drugs. So I made a big change back then to go into drug research. And I, uh, as Dane mentioned, I've been uh, researching drug, drugs like GHB for almost two decades. Uh, I started interviewing people about GHB back in 2001. Um, I've witnessed a lot of GHB use and GHB related overdoses uh, over the years. And this is the main reason I became a drug researcher many years ago. Uh, GHB was always one of the most controversial drugs and apparently it still is. Uh, this is actually the first paper I ever published. Uh, I was actually accepted when I was a master's student back in 2005 and I focused on uh, GHB use among gay men and these were based on qualitative interviews. So uh, again, I made sure my first paper was focused on GHB because that's how important I felt it was uh, and still is. So what is GHB? So GHB stands for gamma hydroxybutyrate. It's naturally occurring in the tissue of all or most mammals. And it was first uh, isolated uh, over a half a century ago in 1960. Uh, it's a central nervous system depressant with effects similar to alcohol. Um, a lot of people, as you might know, call it the date rape drug, uh, particularly people in the media. Uh, but this only accounts for a very small portion of use, I believe. Um, most use appears to be uh, recreational and intentional. And I have gotten into full like, arguments and blowouts with very educated and intelligent people who swear that no one uses GHB on purpose. Um, so there's just, I've noticed a general unawareness that GHB is a recreational drug and not just the quote unquote date rape drug. Um, I also wanna note that at least here in the US, GHB is prescribed uh, to treat sleeping disorders under the name Zyrum, uh, but I think that's pretty rare. So right now I'm gonna briefly talk about the prevalence of use in the US and in New York City. Uh, so GHB, it's really difficult to study in the general population because prevalence of use is actually very rare. Uh, we typically have to focus on at-risk groups to really find out what's going on with GHB. So my main population currently is nightclub and festival attendees, uh, particularly in the EDM scene, which stands for electronic dance music. Um, these, I believe, are the highest, highest risk for GHB use. And of course, as Dane mentioned, uh, sexual minorities are the other main at-risk group. And of course, these, not, these groups are not mutually exclusive um, because, again, most of the g people who identified as gay back then, most of those men were in the nightclub scene. So there's quite an overlap. Uh, this is a little line graph I put together a few days ago showing uh, national prevalence among high school seniors. So this focuses on past year GHB use. If you look in the, uh, the early 2000s on, on the left, uh, estimated prevalence among high school seniors, 12th graders, was about 2%. Um, so that's the highest it's ever been uh, recorded, at least in this national survey here in the US. Uh, but keep in mind that even though it hit about 2%, this is much lower than drugs like ecstasy and cocaine. And as you can see, all the way down through 2018, use went in a staggered manner, uh, decreased. It, currently, it's only estimated to be less than a half a percent of high school seniors have used GHB in the past year. It is very much decreased in popularity. Um, I don't have a lot of information on sexual minority uh, people specifically in New York City, but I've referred to this great paper plenty of times by um, some of my former colleagues here in New York City. Uh, and these estimates focus on people who identify as sexual minorities or uh, actually just sexual minority men back then, uh, not only from nightclubs, but largely from nightclubs. And you could see that the pattern is a little bit similar to the previous slide where use decreases in a little bit of a staggered manner. But again, the study ended well over 10 years ago. Um, with regard to adults in the US right now, uh, as you, you can see that I, I intentionally made this figure uh, largely blank, because so I, I didn't want it to appear deceiving uh, for the line to stop at say 0.2. I wanted to end it at, uh, on top at 0.5 to show all the way up at the top 0.5, that's a half of a percent. So when you look down at the tallest bar, the second bar, uh, 
ages 18 to 25, that's only 0.1 of a percent of people in the U.S. in that age group are estimated to have used GHB in the past year. So that's 0.1 percent. That's one out of a thousand people. So GHB use is extremely rare right now, at least in the U.S. And these are what the uh, reported poisonings look like in the U.S. Um, this, I guess, corresponds to some of the previous prevalence estimates I just showed you, uh, because you could see, uh, if you recall, I showed you that in the early 2000s, prevalence was higher, and then it dipped. So it looks like as prevalence went down, so too did reports of poisonings. So, of course, the nightclub scene is, uh, I think, the most important scene to focus on. Uh, gay, hetero, whoever is attending these scenes. Uh, so GHB is most popular in these scenes. But we're unsure how many people use GHB in these settings uh, because these studies that are published usually only focus on what we call convenience samples. Uh, speaking of convenience samples, back in 2001 to 2003, we found that almost a third of club drug using gay and bisexual men in New York City had used GHB in the past three months. But this is among people who report using club drugs. So this is an overestimate and it's based on a convenience sample. So um, again, there are a lot of issues with studies like this. Uh, the, the New York City nightclub scene now, uh, well, not now yet, but anyway, in, in the late 1990s is when GHB gained popularity, at least in the New York City uh, nightclub scene. Uh, by about 2000, 2001, GHB became very popular in the club scene and also very problematic. Uh, these are some newspaper clippings that I took from New York Times and some other sources back from 2000, 2001, and I was there for most of this. Uh, Chelsea is an area of Manhattan, in case you don't know. There are major clubs like Twilo, Tunnel, uh, Uptown a little bit like Sound Factory, where GHB single-handedly led to the closures of many of these clubs. Twilo, which was the hottest gay party around featuring DJ Junior Vasquez, uh, shut down in 2001 because of all the GHB related overdoses doses there. There were two, at least two deaths related, GH, related to GHB at Twilo. Um, I believe there was one at a Paul Van Dyke performance, as according to the ad at the bottom, and they even had their own room where they would essentially leave the bodies and wait for people to become conscious again and then call a private ambulance and call them out. This was their way of circumventing um, calling the police. They'd have their own private ambulance service and take care of the people themselves. Uh, I don't know if that's happening these days, but it definitely did back then. Um, so with regard to estimates of past year uh, GHB use in the current EDM party scene in New York City, it appears that since 2016, GHB use has been increasing. Uh, only by a percent or two, but I did a te quick test for trend the other day. It looks like it's significantly increasing. I don't know if this will continue, but it's, in my opinion, a little bit alarming. And with regard to sexual orientation or sexual identity, uh, this is stratified by only by people who identify as men or women and broken down to these four groups. Uh, I know there are plenty of issues with this, but it's just... Uh, we had so many, so few people identify as other sexuality that we had to collapse them. Uh, but anyway, as you could see uh, by the second little cluster here, that gay men uh, are at the highest risk for uh, GHB use in the past year. Almost one out of 10 have used in the past year. Um, so this is exponentially higher than most other groups. So clearly, it, gay men or men who identify as gay on the survey are at highest risk for past year GHB use. Other sexuality comes in as a co-second. Of course, women who identify as lesbian beings are also at, at high risk, but not as much as the gay men. Um, so what is the appeal about GHB? A lot of people have no idea. Uh, so it almost feels like alcohol and ecstasy combined, depending on the dose. Uh, and like ecstasy and alcohol, it's commonly used just to, to socialize, to loosen up in a social atmosphere. Um, it's been described as a pretty clean high, and it's also a pretty short-acting high. I mean, if you're not knocked unconscious, uh, the high could last maybe an hour or even less. So, um, and it also typically does not have a hangover. So I think a lot of users find this appealing, that you could use it, get 
pretty high within an hour and then feel fine or even refreshed afterwards. So um, this is something to consider. Uh, a lot of users feel GHB is the safest drug, which is very interesting and possibly paradoxical because most of these people know that they're going to quote unquote overdose or pass out at some point, but they still consider it the safest drug. Um, so this is another thing we have to face in, in the community. Uh, it seems to be cheaper than most drugs such as ecstasy, uh, at least the, the bang you get for your buck within that hour or so, uh, and considering the, no hangover. Uh, it's also been described as the ultimate sex drug. Of course, it's in, it's in competition with drugs like crystal meth, uh, but it has much, much different effects than crystal meth. This is a blatantly sexual drug, um, much different from meth. And of course, a lot of people combine GHB with meth uh, for sex and not for sex. Uh, so here's a quote uh, from someone I interviewed in the early 2000. Uh, this person says that uh, GHB makes him feel like a sexual predator. Um, the drug is just so sexual that it's sickening. Um, he takes the drug and his mind is there. It's on sex. And another person said that he feels like he's a savage when he's on uh, GHB. It's like he's just devouring his partner and the, pow the partner's devouring him, almost in a violent, uncontrolled way. Uh, there's no interior monologue, just totally connected as if they're animals. Uh, very animalistic uh, sex uh, has been described related to GHB. So what are some downsides of GHB? Uh, well, there are plenty. Uh, well, one of the most important things you have to keep in mind is that it has what we call a steep dose response curve, meaning that even small increases in a dose could lead to disproportionate increases in effects. So if you think if you're going to have a beer and then an hour later you have another beer, um, the effects are just going to pile on accordingly as, as they should, dosed out. Uh, one dose is going to have the same effect. Uh, but with GHB, it's a little bit different. That second dose could really kick you in the ass and knock you unconscious. It kind of comes out of nowhere. So that's the steep dose response curve that makes it particularly dangerous. Combining GHB with downers such as alcohol could lead to synergistic effects. Uh, so, I mean, as if you're not, you know, being hit hard enough by GHB, if you mix it with alcohol, it's going to hit you much harder than either drug separately. Combining it with ketamine, I believe, could lead to seizures. I've seen it happen. At least that was the word back in the day. Um, so you've got to be careful with regard to whichever drugs you combine GHB with. Uh, GHB is highly stigmatized in many or, or most social circles. Um, so that's another downside because a lot of people are not talking about their use, which I believe makes use more dangerous. You never know what you're getting. And this goes for any drug, especially drugs like ecstasy. But any illegal drug, you don't know what you're getting. And even if you do know it's GHB, you're not going to know the potency. And GHB can be addicting. I've known a couple of, of good friends years ago that actually had to go to rehab. And people say that once you're actually hooked on it, it can be as strongly addicting as a drug like heroin. And the withdrawal could be pretty nasty. Um, and finally, on this slide, I, I just want to say that a lot of people don't know how to handle an overdose. And I think that's kind of scary. So wh what is this thing we're calling overdose? And I want to mention the, thing, the reason I put overdose in quotes right now is because uh, overdose could be a little bit of a misnomer uh, because GHB is supposed to knock you out. Uh, GHB was originally sold as a sleep aid in like GNC stores uh, back in the day, a couple decades ago. So it's supposed to knock you out. So really people are taking sub anesthetic doses to get high. So keep in mind that the drug is supposed to knock you out. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. So what happens during a GHB overdose? Uh, the user feels extremely high or euphoric and so high that the user almost can't stand it anymore. Like you feel you're so high that you're almost gonna collapse. Uh, and when that happens, it means you are about to collapse. The body starts to feel very heavy. It's difficult to communicate or walk. You'll see people struggling to stand or walk. They might be falling and trying to get up. Some people experience what we call myoconic jerks, which is kind of like uh, mini, like 
similar to like mini seizures, just quick little shakes. It doesn't look great. Uh, the user might have a few minutes to find help or to find a safe area to collapse once the person is feeling uh, way too high. So once you notice that you know, you're feeling way too high, you have a couple of minutes to try to save yourself somehow. A lot of people try and fight, quote unquote, falling out. That means falling unconscious from GHB, uh, with or without stimulants. So some people will just get up and walk around and run around, try and stay awake. Usually doesn't work. You'll see someone walking around and bam, right on the floor. Uh, some people start downing stimulants, cocaine and particularly crystal meth. They will run around, start asking, you know, can you give me a bump of crystal? Thinking it's going to wake them up. It appears that sometimes it does help keep them awake. Uh, other times it doesn't. I've seen bouncers and people in clubs putting bumps of crystal meth under people's tongues and their nose when they're unconscious, and they still lay there like essentially in a coma and the bump does not wake them up. So by the way, I do not recommend that, but it might help sometimes. Um, a lot of users I've noticed are very strange when they're about to fall out from taking too much GHP. I've noticed that a lot of them make what I call primitive looking faces. Uh, I, I frequented this club called Sound Factory where a lot of the girls were very attractive and they wind up using GHB and all of a sudden, I'd see some attractive girl come up to me making this like caveman looking face and making weird gestures and then pass out on the floor. So uh, that to me is a telltale sign of GHB. I, I haven't seen that with other drugs. Um, what happens after an overdose? So the user will likely be in literally a, a coma for an hour or two, possibly more, depending on how much they take. Um, as I mentioned, administering, administering stimulants to a comatose body does not appear to wake the person up, um, at least when, when I saw that. Uh, respiration slows down, and that is probably the most dangerous aspect of GHB overdose. Any obstruction could breathe, to breathing could be fatal. So even if you did not take that much before you pass out, if you pass out at a weird angle and your neck is turned or something's on your mouth or neck and you can't breathe, you might die. You might suffocate. Anything could happen when you fall out after GHB because you cannot be woken up. People who are in GHB comas, they could be stepped on, trampled on. I've seen my own friends thrown out of the, the front of club doors onto the sidewalk on the streets of Manhattan with people just stepping over them like they're trash. Uh, it's sad. Um, you don't want this to happen to you. And you could be raped. Uh, it's a very scary situation when you're knocked out. Um, these days, a lot of people around you don't know how to handle a JHB overdose. Back in the day, sadly, I think people knew what to do because it was so prevalent. Um, and people just faced the situation. But now a lot of people are not familiar with it. Uh, your friends might panic and call an ambulance. You wake up in the emergency room with amnesia, probably. And even if you really didn't need an ambulance, that could be a hefty hospital bill that you wake up to. So the people around you might not know what to do, and you might not know what to do. So how can we reduce harm uh, among people who want to use GHB? Um, so if you insist on using, here are some uh, things that I recommend you could do. Um, make sure that if you decide to use, that it's in a planned manner. Um, you should just not use it on a whim. Uh, if possible, just don't use it. Uh, and if you decide to use it, please be well-rested and healthy. Don't co-use other depressants such as alcohol. It can be very dangerous. If you insist on using it, make sure to take small and measured doses. Never just take a big swig uh, from something you don't know. If it doesn't work or isn't working enough, don't immediately redose. And in fact, just try not to redose at all if you insist on using, uh, because that second dose could really kick you in the ass. Uh, be in a safe place with people you trust. Uh, you don't want to be out at a strange place without friends and then fall out after taking GHB. It could be a nightmare. And your friends must know when you're on GHB, particularly the friends that you're out with. They have to know that you're on it, so they know how to respond if something goes wrong. 
and of course they have to know about GHB uh, first of all. Um, so, and my, I think this is my last slide, but about GHB education, uh, users need to be educated about the drug first and foremost. If someone decides they're gonna use, they need to know what the drug effects are and what could happen if you use. People at high risk uh, need to be educated. So in particular, night club attendees and people who identify as sexual minorities. Um, so and this goes for people who intend on using and who don't intend on using because we need people around to look after each other who are uh, people who are using. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of stigma associated with GHB use. You might be tempted to stigmatize people who use, but my warning is that stigmatized use leads to hidden use. And that worries me because when people are too scared to tell their friends that they use GHB, there's no one to look after them. Uh, you, stigmatizing is a double-edged sword. We have to be careful with it. And finally, people need to look after their peers. They need to know how to spot someone who's overdosing and they need to know how to respond uh, and to, to get help and take care of the person who needs help. So that's that, thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I think you've certainly given us uh, some great ideas around the need for uh, education uh, for gay bisexual men who are interested in or who are currently using GHB, but also for those in their social networks who are often on the front lines of responding uh, to incidents like GHB overdoses, which we uh, hear anecdotally are certainly happening uh, here in Ontario. I'd like to turn things over now to Kiffer, uh, who will be sharing recent and relevant data on the use of GHB by gay and bisexual men here in Ontario and in Canada. Kiffer is a CHR Health Systems Impact Fellow, working with the Community-Based Research Centre and the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. His research explores patterns of substance use among gay, bi, and queer men, and the harm reduction and treatment preferences for guys who use drugs. So Kiffer, I welcome you uh, to share your screen, please. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dane and uh, Dr. Palomar. I thought that was a very interesting presentation. I think this uh, next segment kind of builds upon that um, in getting into some of the epidemiology around GHB use among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. And so um, our main focus for this is to kind of talk a little bit about prevalence, you know, how many guys use GHB uh, in Canada specifically, how much of this use is during sex and how has that changed over time. Um, also examining the motives of why guys use drugs uh, and then comparing the risks and looking at access or, or to, to, uh, to look at, you know, so, sort of what harm reduction practices are employed, uh, particularly with regards to STI and HIV. Most of the data for this presentation comes from the SexNow survey. Uh, some of you are probably likely familiar with SexNow. It's been going on since 2002 as a serial cross-sectional survey with annual or semi-annual uh, iterations. Uh, most of the data presented comes from the most recent 2018 survey, which was conducted in person at 15 or 16 uh, gay pride festivals or parades across Canada. And so uh, it's kind of a, a good broad surveillance. It's not a perfect random sampler by any means, but it, it does capture a large number of people. Um, and then we also have data that's added to this presentation for 1415, which has, I think, about 8,000 responses. And then the data, the 2018 data has about three or 4,000. And, uh, and so basically um, the 14, 15 and 2011 data that was collected online, this 2018 data is largely collected in person. And so speaking back to the last presentation about where you sample and how you sample kind of makes a bit of a difference in the prevalence estimates. And so we'll show you a bit of that. Um, and, and so uh, for those of you who want to know more about sex now, you can visit, uh, you know, the uh, CBRC's website that has more information. Um, but, but generally, it's, it's 
meant to surveil and to uh, collect information about HIV, STI, substance use, and that sort of thing from gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men. Um, and so uh, in this analysis, we uh, basically wanted to look at some of these prevalence estimates and that sort of thing. And so kind of starting with that, we took the data from 2011, 2012, 14, 15, and then the 18 data. You can see that from 11 to 12, there was a slight increase of around, you know, a half percent or so, a little bit more than that. Um, and then the in-person data, which it's a different data collection technique, so it's hard to know how much of that jump is actually due to a real increase or, or if that's just people at pride parades tend to use a bit more uh, frequently. So this is GHB use. Um, in the previous ones were past 12 months, but in the 2018 survey, we asked uh, the past six months, since you can see it's about 7% in the in-person survey uh, from sex now. As you kind of look nationally, that, that varies by province. Um, lower in Alberta than Ontario has about what the average was, which was 7.1, this is 7.4. And then BC and Quebec have uh, kind of more elevated uh, reported use of GHB. And so uh, with Quebec, it's you know nearly double that of British Columbia. And so I think that that maybe speaks to some of the demography of use and, uh, and, and kind of the cities uh, that are reflected there. Um, now turning to looking at, well, how do people use uh, GHB? We can see that again, most people are never using it, but of those who use it, the, the bulk of people are using it once a month or less. And so uh, that's about 4% of the population. And then people are using daily or a few times a week or once a week or less, uh, that tends to be just a very small proportion of those. And so again, that reflects maybe um, event-based use, maybe they're at a club or you know, maybe it's for, for sex. And so, um, so I think that's uh, uh, kind of interesting to see. Um, it is interesting, this, this daily group use. I mean, that's, a, that's a, to me just kind of interesting that there are people who are using GHB, at least reporting daily use. And looking kind of that in the bigger picture of things, we see about 20% of guys in sex now um, didn't, didn't use substance use at all. Of those who did use substances, uh, most didn't use GHB as we reviewed. But then you see about two thirds of those who did use GHB uh, used it during sex, 4.6% versus uh, those who did not. You know, So about two thirds used it during sex. And so that speaks a little bit to the point about the sexual nature that GHB uh, you know, is associated with. Um, you look at motive, motives for drug use. In Sex Now, we piloted in Winnipeg. And so this was one of the questions we had in the Winnipeg data. Um, and then when we launch the 2019 survey, we'll, we'll ask this question of, of national data to get about 10,000 responses on this for motives of, of why people use drugs. You can see that the most common answer is just that it feels good. Uh, but people also use, it for, use drugs for social connection, to get energy, to feel sexual motivation, feel better, and, and so on and so forth. And, and you can see from it down the lane. But I, I'd say the big motives for substance use look to be feeling good and social connection. And so uh, this isn't substance use specific to GHB, um, but we're, we'll probably collect that information in a future, future iteration of sex now. But it is important to kind of have an idea of, of what is motivating uh, use in, in, in our community. Um, then getting back to this idea of it being a sex drug, we see that uh, GHB among drugs uh, kind of sits in the middle. 65% of those who use GHB uh, use it um, during sex. And, and so it's kind of up there with, you know, crystal meth and erectile dysfunction drugs and poppers as being the reason people are using it. A large portion of that, about two thirds, is to use during sex. Um, and so uh, this, this really speaks to, to kind of the difficulty of separating out sex and drug use from one another uh, from the type of environments. I think it makes intervention work um, for this substance in particular, I think it makes intervention work um, all the more needing to be specialized and developed for uh, gay, and bisexual, and other uh, men who have sex with men. Um, you can see that among those who use GHB, about a quarter of those use poppers, about a quarter use erectile dysfunction drugs, about two thirds also use crystal meth, and about half also use ecstasy. And so, uh, and thinking about how GHB fits in kind of the overall substance use patterns of somebody's behavior, uh, 
we can see that it's strongly you know aligned with people use crystal meth people use ecstasy uh, and, and so I think that's also an important feature to kind of recognize that uh, they're using other drugs that potentially um, you know are used to bring about pleasure and feel good feels and to uh, feel connected with their partner and or partners um, and probably used in settings you know kind of like group sex settings and that sort of thing as well and so um, so that's a kind of kind of good to contextualize it in that kind of sex drug use category. Um, I think one thing that we always talk about with substances is, you know, well, people use substances, you know, tend to have mental health challenges. And so uh, we tested this with GHB use. And so you look at people who use GHB, whether or not they have greater depression or anxiety. And so these are kind of the scores. And, and we found no evidence that the, the depression scores or anxiety scores were all that difference based on whether they use GHB. So it doesn't seem to be driven largely uh, by mental health. So that tells me that a bit about that sincere connection and seeking out uh, good feelings uh, isn't necessarily driven by depression or anxiety, um, but, but it's probably just a nature of the social pattern and social fabric that some of uh, communities have. And so, uh, so that's helpful. Uh, and then we look at demographics because I think it's important to Kind of look at you know who who is using and and who uses GHB. Uh, the first thing we kind of look at is rural versus urban. Uh, you can see kind of in this top uh, section here uh, the difference is not not so significant. Um, those who are in urban were tend to be a little bit less likely than those in rural, and so uh, that's kind of interesting to me and surprising because definitely GHB has this club drug vibe to it. And uh, the fact that it's that its use, you know, is uh, you know kind of lower in rural er in urban areas, speaks to the importance of looking to rural interventions as well, um, and and not to ignore that. And I think that maybe also speaks to this nature of uh, using drugs in safe places at home versus at a club and that sort of thing. So maybe that's some of what's going on as well is is why this drug selected. Uh, you can also look at financial situation. In the SexNow survey, we assessed financial situation because we're a national survey, uh, kind of qualitatively. We asked people to say whether they couldn't make ends meet, uh, whether they had to cut back, they had enough but no extra, and then they were comfortable. Those who were comfortable were uh, significantly uh, less likely to use GHB than those who couldn't ha make their ends meet. And so it uh, kind of speaks to maybe some financial syndemic there uh, as being part of what's going on here is is, uh, is an important factor to consider. Um, we also looked at ethnicity, and you see of all the ethnicities, the difference relative to uh, the comparison group is that East Asian uh, were less likely to use, and so that speaks to maybe some cultural attitudes around substance use and that sort of thing. Um, with HIV status was the last significant one. Uh, you see that with H HIV status, uh, they're nearly three times more likely to use uh, GHB compared to uh, HIV negative guys. And then of course age, age was not statistically significant. Um, and so that tells you a little bit about the distribution of people who are using uh, GHB and how it helps to inform interventions recognizing, you know, living with HIV and that sort of thing can, can be a, a, looks like to be one of the largest effects and things that's important to consider. And so POS specific interventions come to mind and that sort of thing as well. Um, with HIV and STI risks, which is something we looked at, we found that generally guys who use GHB tend to have what we would kind of call as quote unquote riskier uh, profiles. They, they you know, are nearly twice as likely to have had a threesome, uh, quite a bit more likely 36% had engaged in group sex compared to 9.7% of people who hadn't used GHB. Uh, they're more likely to engage in both receptive and insertive condomless anal sex. Um, and then they were also more likely to have uh, kind of a more, more partners overall. Um, yet 11.7% viewed themselves at higher risk or high risk for acquiring HIV compared to only 4.7% in the general population or the, uh, uh, of those who didn't use GHB. And so, uh, so they're maybe engaging in risk, but they're also recognizing that they are at increased risk. And so I think that's an important thing to recognize because that allows them to employ uh, risk management strategies 
uh, those specific to HIV, like biomedical prevention strategies, you know, they tend to be more likely, slightly so, to know about PrEP, uh, quite a bit more likely to have ever used PrEP, uh, uh, quite a bit more likely to, to, to know about U equals U, 87.5% versus 70%, and then also more likely to know about PEP, uh, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. And, uh, and so that's uh, important for HIV in the context of this discussion, I think, um, to, to recognize that uh, they, they uh, tend to, even though they're at maybe more quote unquote risk, they are more likely to use these biomedical prevention strategies. Uh, when it comes to testing, uh, they, for STIs, I think I uh, need to change that thing there. It says never tested for HIV, but this is just never tested for any STIs. Um, we see that they're about twice as likely, uh, but it's not statistically significant to have never been tested. They're about half as likely to have never been tested. Um, and, but among those who had been tested, uh, they, were, they were quite a bit less likely, 12.9% versus 23.5% to be tested longer than a year ago. And so that seems to indicate that they're testing at least more frequently or more recently um, as a way to manage their risks for STIs. And so, uh, so it shows that there is a motive in this population to manage their risks and to, to navigate the risks, and they tend to be more aware and willing to utilize those prevention strategies. And so I think that that's a really good sign for uh, planning, a, planning an intervention to help GHB use because these people are conscious and aware of their health and I think want to promote and maximize their, their health while also balancing against their needs and desires for pleasure and social connectedness and, and those sort of things, which are, of course, important to, to our health and our wellness. And then finally, uh, just to kind of give a summary, we see that GHP prevalence may be increasing. We'll test this out in SexNow 2019, which will be administered online, um, which will hopefully be launching here in the next little bit. Um, we also see that most GBMSM who use GHP use it during sex, and uh, most use it less than monthly, and so that gives you an idea of, of the group. So if you're you know, thinking about interventions or thinking about how to help that, you know, maybe future work needs to identify who are these people that use it most regularly. Um, and then whether or not those regular users uh, are better equipped to manage some of their risks, such as those reviewed earlier about overdose and that sort of thing. Um, then we also see that GHB use does not appear to be driven by differences in mental health status. Rather, they use it for a variety of reasons. Uh, in general, we see that people use drugs, use it as I said, for social connectedness uh, and just to feel good. Um, and then we see that while they might be at higher risk for HIV and STIs, uh, they do recognize those elevated risks. Um, in kind of thinking about these results, we should recognize, of course, a bit of the limitations that uh, you know, marginalized men who don't attend Pride or don't want to partake in surveys probably aren't here. Uh, so whether or not they're more or less likely to use GHB is, is unknown. Um, and then we can see that self-reported GHB use uh, is also, um, you know, maybe underreported due to some of the reasons discussed earlier around stigmatization and criminalization. Um, and then uh, again, just want to point out that the motivations for use was just in a subsample of Winnipeg, and that we'll look at that in a, a larger sample in the future. Um, and uh, then, of course, we should recognize that the period prevalence associations here, so looking past uh, over the past six months, doesn't necessarily tell you as much as looking, you know, over specific events and specific encounters. How are guys using this? And I think you'd need qualitative research or event level data to get at that. And so, uh, just to kind of wrap up, just want to acknowledge that SexNow survey is a collaborative nationwide effort with community-based organizations across the country. And so we thank them, thank the participants, and thank you for, for listening today. Thank you, Kiffer, for that very informative presentation. And we definitely look forward to uh, more insights into GHB use from the upcoming version of Sex Now. This time, I want to turn it over for uh, Q&A. If you have a question right now, please send it in the chat box. And I can see we have a couple there, so we'll get started. The first question is related, uh, it's from Lauren, and it's related to 
methods of GHB use or administration. So the question is, can GHB be injected? And if so, how do the effects differ? Uh, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I don't know, I've never heard of it being injected, but I'm sure it could be, but in all honesty, I, I, I really don't know. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. That it's it's probably not as common to to inject it if you can. Um, I think mostly you know it's either clear liquid uh, that can be taken. Yeah. Orally. Absolutely. Likewise, I have not heard of um, anyone injecting GHB. A couple other questions. Um, so if you're a service provider and you're providing, you know, uh, education or information, uh, if you're working with gay by queer men and they disclose to you that they use GHB, um, what kind of questions might you want to be asking folks or what areas of inquiry, inquiry would you want to explore with them? I, I, think, uh, I think one of the most important things providers and, and, and people who are frontline service providers uh, can do when you know they find is to to make sure that they're not being judgmental and to make sure that the information they're providing to participants is based on the kind of information that participants want. And so I think asking some probing questions if you find out somebody uses GHB, uh, probing questions like um, uh, how do you feel about your GHB use or are you at all concerned about your GHB use, uh, that sort of information can help you. Uh, ascertain as to how open or interested they are in kind of giving a full rundown of, of, of GHB harms and that sort of thing. Because I think uh, I think it can be pretty off-putting, just like it is for many guys uh, interacting with the healthcare system uh, when a when a healthcare provider makes assumptions about them or their uh, lives without kind of taking the time to get to know maybe a bit more of the details or a bit more of their experience with the thing. And so I think starting off with a bit of those probing questions to kind of find out more and to listen, I think is, is probably worth a, a good first step. And building, that's a great point. Thanks for discussing all that. Uh, building upon what he just said, um, what concerns me most is that I, I think a lot of medical people, a lot of providers don't know drugs at all. They might have an understanding of weed or alcohol. Uh, when it comes to party drugs, um, a lot of them don't know anything about ecstasy. Uh, a lot of them have probably never even heard of GHB. Um, and I think a lot of the people who have heard of GHB uh, would simply give a very uh, alarmist type of advice, like just stay away from it, it could be deadly. And with, so I really think more, I think medical providers need a lot more information or a lot more education on drugs in general, mm -hmm. uh, particularly among these uh, less prevalent party drugs. Absolutely. This is a great question from the folks at ACT. Um, what is a relatively good dose of GHB when you are either first starting to use it or if you're experienced with GHB? And I know there's, I mean, there's lots, I think there's various uh, recommendations that we've certainly come across online. So uh, Joseph, if you could um, speak to that. Um. <sighs> Being an American, we're not great with the metric system. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. But um, a lot of people don't seem to measure their doses here. Right. Back in, what I had seen was always, um, if you open like uh, a water bottle, there's the cap on top. People would consider a cap full of GHB a dose. And that could vary depending on how potent it is. So you would actually have to know what is the potency of the GHB you're taking? And then you would have to try and measure it out accordingly. Um, so I don't know how well that could be done, especially in a party environment. Uh, in my opinion, most people have no idea what dose they're taking. And if the standard is a bottle cap, or which people would call a scoop back in the day, um, people would assume that, okay, if one cap affects your friend this way, it's probably gonna affect me the same way. Uh, but you don't know how potent that is. Uh, right. I've seen varying potencies. I'd seen, I had seen some, like a, a yellowish, where people would take 
like a full swig from a Gatorade bottle. And that was the equivalent to one bottle cap of uh, a more potent one. Uh, there was some stuff going around that I knew people got this off the internet years ago that the cap was about half the size of the bottle cap. And that was knocking people over left and right. I mean, we could not wake up people all over the place. Uh, um, so it really depends on what you're doing. I, I don't know the actual uh, milliliters or anything like that. Right. And it would be, it, is it safe to say that if you started with a lower dose, and I've seen some recommendations of 0 0.5 milliliters, and if you didn't feel the effects of that and you redose, that would just further sort of complicate matters. And mm -hmm. But it's like you never know. think about it. If, if someone poured you a shot of alcohol and they didn't tell you what it was, I mean, that could vary tremendously of how, how much alcohol is in that shot. Um, so it's the same thing with GHB. So I don't know how it would be measured if, the, if it's not standard, right. if it's not the standardized product that you buy in CVS. Our next question is from Kiro. Why don't we have any studies that show a correlation between steroid use and GHB? More gay men are using steroids and using GHB for muscle development. And gay men living with HIV are more prevalent to use steroids as well. And using GHB for muscle repair is becoming popular. I think this is important from a harm reduction perspective that we address this increasingly popular use. That, that's a great point. Um, so a point I, I think I alluded to but didn't really get into is that um, a, a lot of use in, in the 90s, it was sold, GNC used to be sold, GNC, GHB used to be sold in health food stores like GNC back in the 90s. Um, and it was sold there because it was, people believe that it, it'll knock you out quicker, put you into REM f faster, and then you'll, uh, it'll increase your growth hormone. Um, I don't know how true that is or whether or not that's significant. I feel like I've seen articles that have looked at it, but in small sample sizes. But indeed, people do use it to sleep and therefore to use, uh, to increase muscle growth. Uh, it probably is correlated with steroids. I'm sure someone has looked at that before. It hasn't been specifically what I've looked at. But um, that's another point that you know, a lot of people might be using it for reasons other than to get high, and we can't ignore those reasons. And you had mentioned that um, in your presentation, Joseph, that some uh, friends and bystanders aren't always aware of necessarily the best way to respond to a GHB overdose. Um, what should folks be, be doing in the event of an overdose for their, their friends, their sex partners? I mean... I don't, I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm an epidemiologist, but my, thinking of myself back in the day, I was surrounded by it. I was not a professional. I was a party person. So back in the day, I would have taken care of the person at, at wherever it happened or mm -hmm. other people would have. I don't know if that flies th these days. I don't know if that's the appropriate thing to do or if it ever was the appropriate thing to do. Uh, again, I, I don't think people are leaving po bodies piled up in closets of nightclubs like they used to. I mm -hmm. hope they're not. But if, if they are 100% confident that the person is going to wake up in an hour, does that person have to wake up in the emergency room? I mean, I personally don't think so. But I'm sure if I talk to a, an emergency like medical physician, that person might disagree and say no, because even with a small percent chance of dying, they should go to the, the emergency room. So I, I think it really depends on the situation, and uh, I don't really know what the norms are these days, in all honesty. Absolutely. I mean, some of the things we've heard are, um, of course, staying with the person, monitoring mm -hmm. their breathing, putting them in the recovery position, so on their side, um, mm -hmm. to prevent choking, say, if they uh, vomit. Um, but I think what you speak to, Joseph, is like an important sort of ethic around community caring for, for one another. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, if someone G's out every day, that's what they do. And if people witness it all the time, they're going to become immune to it. It's not going to affect them that much anymore. They might just know this person's going to wake up in an hour, make sure he's on his side, check his breathing, he'll wake up. But... I, I don't know how many people are, are aware of, of that situation these days. 
And in terms of like, what are some of the potential long-term consequences of regular GHB use? I have heard that with longer, like prolonged use, uh, it does uh, mean that some folks have to go if they want to reduce their use or abstain from GHB, that they have to do so in a medically supervised setting. Uh, is there anything you can speak to there, Joseph? Not really, but um, I mean, you do, you can build up a tolerance if you use it frequently enough. And you could definitely experience withdrawal if you use it too much. And that gets really dangerous. Um, that's going into addiction territory. Um, so people who insist on using should not use often. They think, oh, it's a nice clean high. It used to be sold in the, the health food store. It's fine. It's the safest drug. Um, no, because I knew plenty of people like that that wound up in rehab. Um, so you, it'll sneak up on you like plenty of other drugs. Absolutely. Um, question here, why might some folks respond to using GHB with aggressive and vocal behavior? That is, I, I talked about like the caveman-like behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when, if you're not fighting it, I don't think you're gonna be aggressive. Uh, but when you're fighting it, and especially if you're piling stimulants like Coke or meth on top of that to try and reverse the GHB overdose, that's when the weird stuff starts happening. You will see people, uh, as was mentioned, acting aggressive or extremely agitated, um, doing strange things. I had uh, a hetero guy humping my leg one day, and he didn't even know he was doing it. He was out of it, and I think he went and passed out somewhere. It just You see the strangest things when people are trying to fight a GHB overdose. Mm -hmm. uh, aggression and agitation appear to be part of that pretty often. Some great advice here from Nick uh, and a point that, you know, bottle cap sizes vary and that we need to encourage people to properly measure their doses and practice at home to determine the potency, which I think, you know, if we think about the setting in which uh, substance use among gay men can sometimes take place, like in a nightclub setting where there's, it's a much more stimulating environment um, it could be difficult, you know, it's dark, uh, difficult to gauge uh, your dosing. Uh, so I think a really good practical tip there. Uh, and of course, uh, and using with use others. It. Don't use it a nightclub. I mean, hands down. I mean, mm -hmm. you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting people around you at risk. And the club could get shut down if something happens. So try not to do it at clubs if possible. Uh, and again, yeah, we encourage people to cut their second dose in half and also make notes about when you are dosing so that you don't forget how long it's been between doses. Mm. Using your phone as a tool to remind yourself is great. Absolutely. Uh, a great question here from Garfield. Are there any antidotes uh, to reverse GHB toxicity or overdoses? I don't know. I, I'm not a medical person. I don't know. But what I've seen out in the clubs, as I mentioned, with you know, people trying to reverse the situation themselves with stimulants, and it doesn't appear to work very well. I am not sure if there are any medical things out there. I mean, benzos are used to, uh, to, to treat agitation across the board in, in medical settings, but I'm not sure what's used for GHB, in all honesty. Uh, likewise, yeah, I have not heard of um, uh, something similar, for example, like to, to naloxone that's used to, to reverse opioid mm -hmm. overdoses. I'm not aware of anything similar for GHB. Um, and that's another great point, naloxone. You're going to see people like a good Samaritan thinking, oh, this person OD'd on heroin, and then they're going to be administering naloxone, someone who's really on GHB. I mean, I don't think it's dangerous, but you're going to have situations like that, too. Absolutely. All right, so it looks like it's about 1.30. Uh, so that concludes today's webinar. I wanna offer my sincere thanks to our speakers, uh, Joseph and Kiffer, for the time that they've given in preparing uh, their presentations and for their expertise and uh, really wonderful insights into GHB use among gay men. Along with a link to a recording of today's webinar, you'll also be invited to complete a short evaluation survey. And these are really helpful as they guide future planning and informs the development of future GMSH webinars. So thank you in advance for completing those. The GMSH is active across the social channels you see below at GMSH Alliance. Uh, my contact info is listed.
and uh, we encourage you to reach out to us uh, at any time. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and wishing you an excellent afternoon.